Okay, so we'll continue where we were last week in Revelation 12, if you would turn there. Um, we covered verses 6 and 7 last week, so this week we'll cover the, the rest here on the outline, which is verses 8 through 12. Uh, what we've seen so far in chapter 12 is really the spiritual battle over the kingdoms of but mostly the earth, because that's what Revelation is concentrated on. The prophecy program has to do with the earth, whereas for us today, it's heavenly places. And so we saw in verse 1 of chapter 12, the woman appears, which is Israel. There is a child born from Israel. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, through his sacrifice, through his death, burial, and resurrection, he... Uh, wins the victory over death. He is able to bring Israel into the kingdom. And so then in verse 5, you see that he is to rule all nations. So he, yeah, Israel is going to rule with him, and he's going to rule over the Gentiles. And that's the still future kingdom. And then in verse 6, it goes back to really halfway through the tribulation period. Uh, we had read in chapter 11 about the two witnesses and how at the beginning of the tribulation period there really isn't a believing remnant because if you believed you were raptured up and so God starts with those two witnesses that are in the temple they prophesy in front of the temple and they prophesy for the first three and a half years of the tribulation period and there's a believing remnant that's built up and we see from chapter 7 that there are 144,000 Jews that are sealed so those are the ones who believed at least 144,000 they're sealed and verse 6 is talking about that, where it says, The woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God. This woman is that believing remnant of Israel, not the nation as a whole, but those who have faith in, in what God has told them. And their fleeing into the wilderness represents them um, going outside of the apostate Israel religious system, the Babylonian religious system that the Antichrist is going to have. They go outside of that. Uh, and they go into a wilderness, and that's where they learn, um, as I put on your outline too, they receive living bread and living water while in that wilderness. So they're built up spiritually. They don't have the material goods, but they're built up spiritually. And that's why in verse 6 says, <clears throat> where she hath the place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. <coughs> that's a reference to being fed the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. Primarily, it's looking at the spiritual feeding, that they feed on the Word of God. Uh, they probably do receive physical food as well as they did in the book of Exodus. God fed them with manna in the wilderness, so He's probably feeding them with that as well. Uh, but primarily, what's the most important thing isn't the physical food, it's the spiritual food. It's that they're ready to enter into the kingdom of God and take those positions as priest of God over the over the Gentiles because verse 5 mentions that Jesus Christ is going to rule over all nations with the rod of iron. The rod of iron is God's law covenant, that Mosaic law. And so you've got Israel here, they have, they take the in faith, they believe God's law covenant and God feeds them and they learn those things so that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom, now they know how to rule with him. They have the the information that they need uh, to be able to rule over the nations. And so then in verse 7 now, uh, we see the scene is switched to, it says, there was war in heaven. So we've, we've been talking about the earth and the earthly kingdom, and now uh, the scene is switched to heaven. And it, there's this war, it says, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. So Michael is the archangel that's on God's side. We read that in Jude verse 9. And he leads God's angels against the dragon who is Satan and his angels, which are the devils or the demons there. And there's, a, there's this fight. And I mentioned last week that he fights him with God's word. That he says, like he says in Jude 9, he said, The Lord rebuke thee. Um, he uses the, the word of God as quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, according to Hebrews 4 verse 12. And so he's using that word of God to win the spiritual warfare over Satan and his angels. And we find in verse 8 now, and this is where we pick up here, is that uh, Michael and his angels win. It says, and prevail not. So the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. 
your fill in the blank for verse 8 there is the body of Christ takes their positions in heavenly places. The body of Christ takes their positions in heavenly places. Uh, so you notice it says, basically, the dragon and his angels, even though God has won the victory, Jesus won the victory over Satan through the cross, uh, he won that victory over death, but Satan still has, as we're told in 2 Corinthians, he's the prince of the power of the air. Um, he's the god of this world. Uh, he still has, I mean, you see it today looking at the world, he still has a great influence over this world. Ephesians 2 says the people who are unsaved are in the course of this world. So Satan still has a lot of control both in heavenly places and on the earth, even up to this time. Um, the book of Job, for example, shows Satan coming to God's throne and reporting in there. And he has the ability to afflict Job and take away his riches and take away his physical health. And so he still has that power. But when you get halfway through the tribulation period here, there is this war and they're cast out of heaven. Um, if you go to Ephesians chapter 1, because our realm is the heavenly places, um, that was a mystery until revealed to the Apostle Paul. And so because it was a mystery and it's part of our program today and not part of the prophecy program, you don't see it revealed in the book of Revelation. But in the book of Ephesians, we're told uh, about Jesus here. And in Ephesians chapter 1, you look in verse... 19, Ephesians 1 and verse 19 says, What is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? So you've got the power of God here. And verse 20 says that that power, it says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So you have spiritual warfare, Satan and his angels, and uh, what we find is through the death and burial and resurrection of Christ, that God rot rights, rots his power, he has his power, demonstrated and he won the victory over Satan. Uh, so you've got in verse 19, you know, about the working of his mighty power and talking about that, it was wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So God wins the victory over Satan through the death, burial, and, and resurrection of Christ. And because he's won that, then uh, verse 21 says that Christ is far above all principality and power and might and dominion. So you've got all these spiritual things. You've got Satan and his angels. You've got God and his angels. And Satan has tremendous influence and power in those realms until, in fact, the book of Job says, the heavens are unclean in thy sight. So he's got this tremendous power. But then when the cross work of Christ is accomplished, then God wins the victory over Satan so that now God has the dominion over the world, over both heaven and earth. And Christ is far above all those principalities and powers. That would be Satan and the devils and, of course, God and his angels, everybody there included. He's far above all that. And so since now that he has the power, then verse 22, God hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So since Christ has the power, then he can... He has the power to fill those positions, the principality, the power, the might, dominion, every name that is named, all those positions. He can fill those, and in verse 22 it says he gave it all over all things to the church. And in verse 23 says, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Uh, that's why we call today what we are is the body of Christ. He is the head, and we are the body, and since he has the power over these spiritual positions, then he is able to kick Satan and his angels out of those positions and replace them with us, the church, the body of Christ, so that we fill those positions, and we have that on our chart, that the main sphere of influence for the body of Christ is the heavenly places. Um, this 
right here, back in Revelation 12 now, and verse 8, uh, really verses 7 through 9, this is the time when this actually takes place. Even though God has the power, again, we we mentioned that Paul's epistles say that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. So even though Christ has won the victory through the cross, and he has, he's above all these positions, he has yet to place the body of Christ into those positions. Um, he's waiting until, Romans 11 tells us, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So if you've got, I'm just going to make up some numbers, if you say you've got a thousand principalities and 10,000 powers and 100,000 mites, well, he's waiting until he gets the church, the body of Christ, that has enough sound doctrine in them to fill those positions. And maybe right now he's got 985 of the principalities filled, let's say. So now he's not going to kick Satan and his angels out of that position yet because he still needs 15 more people. He's waiting until the fullness be come in until he's got all those people the, in this case you know I'm again I made up the numbers but until he's got the thousand principalities and the ten thousand powers and the hundred thousand mites until he's got that that's when the rapture takes place so you know people will say well you know a lot of times people confuse the rapture with the second coming of Christ and they look for signs like we have in the book of Revelation well, there really aren't any signs, any prophecy to be fulfilled for us today because we're in the mystery program. Um, so it's just going to be the rapture. And the time, really the way we know when the rapture takes place is when all those positions are filled. God's just waiting for the body of Christ to be edified in the doctrine, learn that. And so then they say, okay, well now we've got somebody who is now qualified to fill a power. So now we only need 14 more. You know? And so once all those positions are filled... Then God says, okay, I've got it, and I can fill them uh, with the body of Christ. So now, I'm going to rapture them up. And then at the same time, he starts this program back up, the prophecy program. And he's, because now he's got to get Israel saved so they can be in the kingdom, so that he can throw Satan out of the earth. And so halfway through the tribulation period, um, we've already gone up, raptured up, up there in heavenly places. 1 Corinthians 3 says that there is a judgment of the body of Christ and we're given rewards according to the faith that we've had in the doctrine. And so you've got this judgment that takes place. So now God knows halfway through the tribulation period, he's already got the people to fill those positions that Satan and his angels are going to be cast out of. And he's already given the judgment to say, okay, you are a principality, you're a power, you're a might. And he's got those figured out. So then... Now he can actually cast out Satan and his angels. And that's what takes place here. So in Revelation 12, verse 7, we'll read these three verses again. Verse 7 says, There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. The reason they did not prevail is because Christ has the power over them. He's conquered those, and he's far above all those principalities and powers through his death on the cross, his burial and his resurrection. He conquered death. Death was the last enemy to be conquered. He conquered it. And so when this war is fought now, the devil and his angels do not prevail because of what Christ did on the cross. So they prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So they're cast out of heaven. Verse 9 says, The great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the war there is in heaven. Halfway through the tribulation period, Satan and his angels are cast down to the earth. There is not found, it says, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. That's because now we, as the body of Christ, have filled those positions. Satan, he, God said when he had the rapture, he says, I've got all the people I need. I've got all the principalities, the powers, the mights, the dominions. I've got all those positions filled with believers who have had faith in the doctrine and Paul's epistles. And so they're qualified for those positions. So now I'm going to kick out the devil and his angels and I'm going to replace them with the body of Christ, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Yes, sir. Colossians chapter 2 would be a reference to his right to throw them out. In other words, he took their their authority to, 
to occupy those positions in verse uh, 15. Right, yeah. If you look in, starting in verse uh, 14 there, yeah. um, Colossians 2, 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. That's the big thing, is that Satan can hang over our head and say, you deserve to be here. You don't deserve eternal life because of your sin. And Jesus Christ, he goes to the cross, he blots out those, the, the law that's against us, nailing it to his cross because he fulfills that through his death. And then verse 15, as E.C. mentioned, uh, because he's done that, it says, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Well, what's the it? The it there is the cross. Um, so, yeah, very good point. That shows you how he spoiled those principalities and powers, saying that the law uh, is not going to condemn us to the lake of fire, and that through the cross work of Christ, his sacrifice was a substitute for us. And because of that, then he can he has spoiled those principalities and powers. He's over them, and then he can fill those positions with us. Yeah. In other words, he, that spoiled is not like he uh, made them look spoiled or something like that. I can't think of the word I'm looking for, but it's their authority to hold those positions. He took it away from them. Right. Yeah, he took it away there because they were in a position, just like I mean, you think of it, we're not worthy in our flesh without the cross work of Christ. We can't take those positions because we've sinned. God says, be ye holy for I am holy. We're unholy, you know, before we're saved, we're unholy, so we can't be in heavenly positions with a holy God. We, we're, not, we're not fit for those positions because of our sin. We're fit for the lake of fire instead. And it's the same thing for the devil and his angels. The book of Matthew says that hell was made for the devil and his angels. They fell, they were in rebellion, so they were no longer holy. So God had to create a place for them to go. They couldn't be with God. Since they're unholy, he cast them down here. Uh, well, he's going to put them in the lake of fire. So, if they're in those positions now, without the cross work of Christ, we're guilty under the law. We've sinned. We don't deserve those positions. So God can't take us as the body of Christ and put us in those positions because we've rebelled, we've sinned, we've come short of the glory of God just like the devil and his angels. But when Christ dies on the cross for our sins and we believe that, then his sacrifice substitute for us. So now we are made holy. You're in Colossians 2, uh, you know, Colossians 3 um, I think it is where it says that you are holy. Yeah, in verse 12, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Because of what Christ did on the cross, now you are holy. So now God has the right. He can say, the devil and his angels, you've sinned, you're in rebellion, you're unholy. The body of Christ, though, because of the death of Christ on the cross, the body of Christ is now holy and beloved. They are part of Christ. So since they're holy and the devil and his angels are unholy, now, like he said, the spoiling of those principalities and powers is that they're removed from those positions. They're not worthy of those positions anymore. And we, since we are now declared holy, can take those positions. And so that's what goes on here. Uh, in Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9, the body of Christ then uh, takes those positions. And you notice there that he is cast out into the earth. Uh, if we keep reading here um, in verse 10 now, Revelation 12, verse 10, it says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. I notice this is said in heaven. So it's not talking about the earth because we still have the last three and a half years of the tribulation to go on earth. But in heaven, there's this voice and saying, in heaven, the devil and his angels are cast out. The body of Christ is taking those positions in heavenly places. And so the voice is, says, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of this Christ. In a reference to in heavenly places. In other words, the statement in the book of Job that says that heaven is unclean in his sight, that's no more a valid statement.
because they've been cleaned up. Satan and his angels who were in rebellion are cast out. We are put in there. We're holy, not because of anything we did, but because of the cross work of Christ. And so now we are placed in there, and so now the heavens are clean. So that's why it says, now has come salvation. In other words, the heaven is saved. Now, saved from the uncleanness and the rebellion against God. The heaven is now all, it's holy. Uh, the strength, the strength of God to cast out Satan and his angels. The kingdom of our God is coming, and all through the power of his Christ. And then it continues in verse 10. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens. Again, the rejoicing is in heaven, because that's clean now. So rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. That's why this last half of the tribulation period is called the Great Tribulation Period. Because Satan, he's got this influence in heavenly places, prince of the power of the air, and on the earth too. So he's got influence in both of those areas. Well, halfway through the tribulation period, Satan and his angels are cast out. They're no longer in heavenly places. So now, he's, you know, Satan isn't like God. He's not uh, all-powerful, all present everywhere, all-knowing. He's a limited being. Um, he can only, Satan can only be in one place at one time. His, the devils can only be in one place at one time. And so now, all his focus, instead of just being in heaven and earth, now all his focus is on earth because he's been cast out of heaven. So there's a concentrated effort by the devil to get the people of the earth um, to follow him. Basically, he says, I've He's lost the heavenly places. They've been reconciled back to God. So now all he's got left is the earth. So his entire focus is going to be on the earth. That's why it says, Woe to the earth, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. He's got a great wrath, and he knows that God has prophesied the second coming of Christ, which is going to be in three and a half years, and he realizes that he, of course, Satan still thinks he's going to win on the earth. So he realizes I've only got a three and a half year period to really get the to get the whole world to follow me, to get up a big enough army to defeat God so that I can have the earth for myself. He's got the heavens, but now I can get, I still have a chance at the earth. So he realizes I've only got three and a half years, so I'm going to make this big concentrated effort to get the earth back or to keep the earth so that God doesn't reconcile the earth back to himself. Uh, if you look over in Matthew. 24. Matthew 24 gives us um, about the end times. Talking about the seven year period of the tribulation period. And you'll notice the first half of the tribulation period is called the beginning of sorrows. The last half is called the great tribulation. Uh, in Matthew 24, Verse 4, Jesus begins telling them about the end times. Matthew 24, verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Those things that are mentioned there in verses 4 through 7 is from the first half of the tribulation period. They, in the book of Revelation, they are the first four seals that are found in Revelation chapter 6. Everything else, the last three seals, the seven trumpet judgments, the seven vile judgments, everything else that you see in the book of Revelation happens in the last three and a half years. So the beginning of sorrows is the, um, the famines, the pestilences, the earthquakes in diverse places, nations warring against each other. That happens, that's the beginning of sorrows. 
But then the last half, that's when the, it's called, you drop down to verse 21. The last half, it says, Matthew 24, 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Uh, so you see that the deception program by Satan is so strong during the Great Tribulation period um, that if it lasted longer than three and a half years, um, verse 22 says, there should no flesh be saved. God has to cut it short to make sure it just goes another three and a half years, total of seven years there, or else the whole world would be deceived. Um, in fact, look over at uh, Luke 18. In verses 1 through 5, there is this parable that's really talking about how, and the point of the parable in Luke 18, 1 through 5, is how God will uh, save His believing remnant of Israel and bring them into the kingdom. Uh, that's the point to learn from that. Uh, you notice in verse 7, Luke 18, verse 7, it says, Shall not God avenge His own elect? which cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Now notice what the next phrase says. It says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, that's his second coming, shall he find faith on the earth? That shows you how strong the deception program of Satan is going to be in that last half of the tribulation period. Christ says in Matthew 24 that if I didn't shorten it, if it went longer than three and a half years here, even the elect aren't going to be saved. Even they would be deceived. And then here we're told that God's going to avenge the elect, but when He comes, is He even going to find faith on the earth? Are there going to be others who will uh, believe by that point? Um, that, that really shows you how strong this deception program is going to be. And you can see it today in the, in the body of Christ. Of course, it's strong today too. You don't have many people who believe. It's always, regardless of where you are in history, it's always just a believing remnant. It's just a minority of people on the earth who believe the gospel and have eternal life. It's never a majority. And so if the Great Tribulation is the worst that it will ever be, and the deception is going to be so strong, and you look at the world today, you look at how few people we have in church, how few people believe this message, well, you could see that when it comes to the Great Tribulation, it's going to be even fewer. In fact, in Matthew 24, Jesus says it's going to be like the days of Noah. What happened with Noah is that he built an ark for a hundred years. Peter tells us that he preached righteousness for that entire hundred years as well. And the result was that no one outside of his family was saved. The justice of God required that Noah and Enoch, who were both preaching at the time, would have had to preach judgment and warn the entire world, everybody, of the flood that was coming uh, because it wouldn't have been just for God to destroy them in ignorance. So he brings Noah and Enoch. They both preach judgment and they have this opportunity to get in the boat, get in the ark and be saved. The whole world has that opportunity, but no one outside of Noah's family believes. Noah, his wife, three sons and their wives, a total of eight people, are in the ark. Jesus says in Matthew 24 that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It says, in those days they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, and then when the flood came, they knew not that the flood was coming. Well, they should have known. Noah preached to them. Enoch preached to them, but they didn't believe. And that's the situation of the tribulation period. They should know the signs are there. They should know the second coming of Christ is there, is coming. They should know the timeline. They've been given the, we know, after the abomination and desolation set up in the temple, three and a half years. We know the second coming of Christ. They should know that. But yet, will he find faith on the earth? Uh, because, and it goes to show you how strong the deception program is. Uh, the way he does it, uh, if we look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, this is, of course, to us today, 
uh, but he will use the same tactics uh, in that tribulation period. We look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13. The Corinthians, according to 1 Corinthians 4.15, they had 10,000 instructors in Christ. But yet a chapter before.